child questions. I wanted to ask you something. Just at the beginning, you said that monks used to do simple things in the monastery and enjoy it until recently. So what uh, do they do now? Well, um, I'm saying that, uh, simply that life's become more complex for everyone, um, including uh, monks, and there are a lot more kind of uh, office work and, and um, uh, that kind of thing, computer work and all those kinds of things. And um, it's not that you can't be mindful or you can't be, uh, you know, a good monk doing all those things, but it's just traditionally um, developing that, that kind of joy and, and uh, mindful flow. It's a lot easier um, with menial uh, physical tasks than it is with tasks where you have to use your brain and you have to talk with people and communicate with people. Sorry, you said, uh, okay, okay. Hello. Ah. I'm writing a book, and I was actually in the So I was in the Yeah, I, um, you know, I, I, I try to to um, emphasize that it's it's the effort itself which is the point, and that the moment we start to um, create expectations or hopes of some result, um, um, then uh, there's a the craving arises in the mind. We start to suffer. And, and this is most common that at the, if you first time that you um, uh, participate in a long retreat um, and then you have some kind of a breakthrough or some kind of experience that you never had before, that of course you become excited by it. Um, and you tend to think, well, yeah, now I'm getting somewhere. Yeah. Um, Pardon? What's the difference? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I mean, the, the, the point I'd like to make, make is that um, you shouldn't give so too much importance to like special experiences. And by special, I mean unusual. Because we, we, this is the idea, you know, we think that meditation, we should be able to experience some, some special feelings we never had before, you know. And then we think, oh, now that's, that makes all the, all the pain in my legs and the pain in my back, it's worth it, you know. I got this triangle, you know. But um, the, 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 this is just one more thing, you know. Um, and the, 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 the point of meditation is that you don't get excited and obsessed um, with anything, and so um, the kinds of things that will arise in your mind and make you want to um, become excited and obsessed, um, you know, develop over time. But this is your challenge as a meditator. It's not to experience some special colors or some special vision. That, that's completely beside the point. Um, you're de- trying to develop this Buddha knowing. They go, rule, and bhagavan. So whatever... 
um, whatever arises in the mind, whether it's fascinating or boring or interesting or unusual or things you've seen a million times before, the meditation is that ability to maintain that consistent clarity of mind. So don't get into, because once you have this idea of um, gaining something, then it's so common, you think, next time you sit, oh, I wonder how I can get into that state again, you know, where well, that was so cool, I felt so great, you know. Yeah, and it, almost everybody does that, you know. Um, but the, wor the worst thing is that when you meet people who've been like that for five years or ten years, you know, they say, when I first started to meditate, wow, you know, I just had this incredible, but ever since, I've never been able to do that again. You know, that's, that's really uh, like the wrong appro approach to meditation. So it's not, it's not what you see, you know, it's not what you know, it's the knowing of it which you're trying to cultivate. Understand? Like the things you can know, the things you can see, the things you can perceive, whether they're created from the subconscious or they're different realms of being, it, it's not important. It's the sense, it's the one who knows. That's, that's the essence of meditation. That's what you're trying to cultivate. Understand? No. Yeah, whatever, you know, if it arises, it arises. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Yeah. So don't worry about it. Um, pardon? Well, the, the fact that you keep doing it. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the worst thing is to stop doing it. And, okay? So you can have all kinds of experiences, and some will be kind of really cool, and some won't be at all, you know? Um, and the thing is, your developing ability just to sit there and learn. So, so from rather from the idea of meditation as something you do in order to get something, it's a, it's a training, it's an education, it's an exploration, it's a learning process. So, so change your idea of, of what meditation is. You know, if you think, oh, I'm going to put some, you know, I'll put some hours on the mat in order to, to get something from it, then it just becomes another worldly activity. You know, it's still, um, it, it's still um, a pursuit of heaven. It's not a pursuit of nibbana. You know, heaven is this kind of a, a permanently pleasant state, permanently exciting state. You know, many people meditate, they don't call it heaven, but really that's what they're interested in. They want to get to a certain level of ease and happiness and bliss and just be able to sustain that for a long time. Think, oh, now I can meditate. But that, that's, that's just for, that's what we call heaven realm. Um, and Buddhism says heaven's okay if you, if you want heaven realm, that's okay, you know, but there's something beyond that, far more profound. Okay, so... What advice would you give for women who live in heaven? Well, no different from men, I would think. Well, my, I, I'm, uh, my, my view, you see, so I'm speaking not as a woman, but I think that this is the best time in the whole history of the human race to be born as a woman. You know, you have so much um, freedom. You know, you look in human history, that women have been under the power of men, usually by the early teens, they're married with children, their life's mapped out for them, no access to education uh, to make a, their way in the world. Now as a woman, you can get married if you want to. You don't get married. Um, you can do that. You can have a you can have a career. You can go off meditate in monasteries. You can you have so much going for you as a woman in the world these days. It, it's never been so good, you know. So take advantage of it. That's that's my view. Thank and, uh, you. Yeah. With respect to our children, mm -hmm. Mm. Mm. Yeah, at the moment, when I said right thinking, I'm not sure whether I was, uh, that was really the best um, uh, phrase to use there. Um, yeah, I, I think in all um, the development of, of Dhamma in whatever area or sphere, then good friends are incredibly important. Um, and to um, have communities of good friends and, 
again, you know, these days we have like social media and you can develop this like groups of, of people who even if you're not seeing each other every day, you can be in touch and sharing thoughts and reflections and encouragement and and um, helping each other out in, in that way. Um, so we all do have blind spots and we all do um, lie to ourselves and, and uh, deceive ourselves. And so having uh, good friends and people who you trust have your welfare um, in mind and that you can, you can hear them when they tell you things you don't want to hear, you know, that, that's, really, that's really valuable. And if you have a, a partner or you have friends, that you have that kind of relationship where you trust them enough uh, that you can hear them say things that you don't want to hear. That's, that's really very good for developing right thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, uh, the questioner um, saying that since since practicing meditation, become more or or just generally in your life and yeah, become more uh, inward, like spending more time alone, not so sociable and extrovert as used to be, and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, so I'll open this up a little bit. I mean, I mean, with um, <clears throat> uh, in like in monastic training in in the forest monasteries, and uh, many many monks, you know, they like to be alone. Um, but usually, uh, we restrict the opportunities for young monks uh, to be alone too much. Uh, they need to have a training of living in community. Um, so it, it's possible for monks particularly to use teachings of the Buddha to justify defilements. You know, like if a monk is, uh, he doesn't get on with other people um, and he quarrels with this person and that person loses his temper, um, then he says, oh, you know, the Buddha says you should live alone on, in a mount, on the mountain, in a cave, you know, I'm obviously on the wrong path, I'm not doing what the Buddha told me to do. So, you know, you can take Buddha um, teaching and justify leaving community and turning your back on relationships and feel very virtuous about it. So that, that's a trap. Um, so it, the question is, um, that movement away from uh, activity and socializing, is that based upon just this general love of, of, and enjoyment of being alone um, and seeing that you're growing through it? Or is it through the fact that when you're with other people, you're confronted with people who have a different idea of who you are than you have, uh, or um, meeting people that you find difficult to get on with, and it's a basically shrinking away from difficulty because if you do that, then it's, then it's not a good thing. Um, so that's something you just have to be very honest and observant about. Um, as regards helping other people, like the Buddha, you're always teaching um, different qualities in groups because there's, you never just like one particular pill or antidote for a problem. You know, there's always more, more complex. So we have a development of loving kindness and compassion and sympathetic joy, the ability to 
appreciate and find joy in the happiness and, and um, uh, success of others. Um, and, but the fourth quality is probably the most important, and that's equanimity. And, and that means that when we want to help somebody, um, our, our pure wish to help somebody is just one factor in the whole situation. You know, there's so many other things. One, does that person want to be happy? Does that person um, trust us enough to let us help them? Um, is that person um, uh, in, in, uh, in a situation where they can even hear what we have to say? Um, there are so many things that can affect our ability to help others. Um, and so even with the best will, some people also um, have very pure heart, but they're just not very skillful. They don't know how to express themselves very well, or they don't choose the right time and place, um, and, and so on. So um, the Buddha said we also need to develop this like uh, equanimity or evenness of mind based on our reflection on law of kamma. So sometimes we say, yeah, that person is, the situation's not ripe. That person's not ripe. So I'm not in a position personally where I can do anything right now. Um, so I just dwell like this, like in neutral gear. But it doesn't mean you say, you just um, forget that, okay, turn your back on them, you can't do anything. But you recognize right now, here and now, I can't do anything. But in, as soon as something changes, if that person opens up, then I, will, then I will help them. So apart from helping others, you've got to help yourself as well. And so when you can't be active, you have to be able to, to dwell in that neutral state rather than feel frustrated or feel that, oh, why can't I do it? I just, I had such a good intention and this is how, you know, this is what happens and, and sort of lose your um, self-confidence in helping others. But, Sometimes they are old and they do not have this capacity. And I, I really want to help them. Mm. So Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I think we have to acknowledge that um, in Asian culture, it's very difficult for parents to, um, to listen to children, um, tell them that maybe they got things wrong or they need to change their thinking and change their way of... Um, they, they know you love them, but it's just really tough for parents to be able to hear this from from their children, and so um, you know this is a you know I, I think just a tra tragedy that sometimes you know you you have to uh, look to someone outside the family group, someone uh, older than yourself that your parents uh, would respect and and can listen to more easily. Um, the other thing is you know that that parents they they hate it when they like, feel like children are like lecturing them you know, or telling them. So um, sometime, you know, it's just, as I say, teaching anyone, it's, it's who you are as much as what you're, you know, if you're practicing Buddhism uh, and they see changes in you, they see you're happy, they see you're content, they see, then they're going to be, uh, you know, impressed by that probably more than uh, your words. Um, or if you, um, if, in a sense, when you're speaking, you say, look, um, you know, I, I don't know that much, but I heard this and, and it just impressed me so much. And I don't know whether, whether you, uh, you share my enthusiasm. So it's more like sharing your experience with them. And, and as a child in, in China or in, in, in Asia, you know, 
um, there's just so many barriers to, to, to this kind of help to, to offer to, uh, to parents. Unless you become a nun, then maybe you could do it. <laughs> but um, in, the, <laughs> in, in the sort of the, the culture that, whether it's a more secular Chinese culture or more religious culture, I think these things are, are you know, very deeply ingrained. And, mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, the example I gave, I think, you know, it's like you, hundred people, you want silence. Um, it's tough. <laughs> you, you, have, you want noise and disturbance. Only one is enough. So, yeah, that's nature as well. I, I, I mean, I think that, you know, as as Buddhists, you know, it, it's not like positive thinking or negative thinking, but really trying to to observe as best we can and developing our ability to observe and cultivating that but i think with with nature um balance is, is an idea but it shouldn't become like the filter or you shouldn't be saying like oh, nature means balance so something natural must be balanced um, because there's a lot of imbalance in nature as well i think you know this uh, how um uh, creatures become extinct, you know, and how evolution takes, I mean, evolution means like a chain constantly falling out of balance, you could, you could say in one way. Um, this, I have a nice story about balance. Um, there's a, do you know what Aikido is? A Japanese, it's kind of gentle Japanese martial art. And so um, one of the students, they speak to their master and and they said, you know, it's incredible. We've been studying with you like for 20 years um, and you never lost your balance, never see you lost your balance once in all that time. Uh, and the teacher said, well, actually, I lose my balance all the time, but I reestablish my balance so quickly that you don't ever, you don't ever see it. Um, so I think that... You know, balance is, is it's not something that there is this balance, but there's a constantly loss of balance, re-establishing of balance in all areas of, you know, big quest, what's the biggest question that a monk or a nun would, would ask the teacher? The most common question is, how do I find a balance between my own practice and, and helping the, the Sangha? You know, and what's the, what's the prob big problem for lay people? How do I find a balance between work and, and, and uh, private time or family and private time? So, you know, the, the question of balance and the achievement of balance, um, that's a big problem. So it shows that, you know, there, it isn't just kind of a natural thing that balance is there. Um, I think that in, in um, you probably have far more knowledge of this, but in a natural world, uh, my understanding is that there, there is coming into balance, losing balance, there, are, there is an overall balance, but that balance is very fragile. And we, of course, we're in, uh, we're in that stage of human history now where all the balance has been threatened. Mm. So, yeah, it's just the way it is. But, but I would say, you know, in terms of why is, you know, people say, why is the news always bad? You know, you read newspapers and everything. So like evolutionary, um, what do they call them, psychologists or whatever, will say that um, from the time when we human beings lived in caves and that um, bad news is far more important than good news. You know, so if you, the good news is if you walk a, like a kilometer down the road there, there's a mango orchard, okay, good news. Um, but the bad news is there's a saber-toothed tiger, you know, just coming over here. There's much more. If you don't go to the orchard, you probably won't die. But if you don't run away from the saber-toothed tiger, you will. So there's this kind of uneven weighting of importance. Bad news means life or death. Good news, not so often. Um, and that's kind of wired into our brains, um, that we are a lot more alert to bad, bad news than good news. That's one theory. 
Um, but I, I would say, so I have some like counterbalance myself to this, is when you read newspapers and news and so, because that reflects that, you know, this mostly bad news, isn't it? But if you look at your own world, you know, not the world, but your world, the world that you experience every day from the moment you get up to the moment you're in bed, for your family, your surroundings of people, you, I would say for almost all of us, good news far outweighs the bad news. Would you say? There's not so many really terrible things happen in our life, and there's a lot of very good things, and a lot of very small good things that we tend to overlook. Um, and that's part of cultivation, is opening your eyes to all these small good things. It's not just like Pollyanna positive thinking, but it's opening your eyes to the, so many good things um, going on around us. Oh, <coughs> excuse me. So I, I, I went to, um, uh, I'm involved in a school here, a Buddhist school, and it was graduation um, last, yesterday evening. And uh, one of the boys, he's like uh, 15, 16, uh, had to come and, and um, say a piece in front of all the teachers and pupils and parents. Um, and uh, he has some learning difficulties already in but we, we wanted to give him a chance, so he spoke a few words, and then he just, he couldn't speak, he froze in front of all these people. Um, and then, immediately, there were all these sort of calls of encouragement, everybody started clapping him, and cheering him, and then he, he still, he's there for a long time, and somebody came up to help him read, and there wasn't like a single person who were, or, you know, a group of kids who were making fun or being there. There was just this whole sense of everybody came together to give this, you know, to help this boy get over his, his nervousness and self-consciousness. It was the most inspiring thing. And it's a small thing, but it, it's, for me, it was uh, very heartening, you know, to, uh, to see that. And I think in our daily life, you know, there are times when, when so many times when just people do small, small little acts of kindness. Um, and that when we get depressed about the way the world is, you know, just um, turn your mind to those things. I say it's not just I'm going to be positive, you know, and just try and be, you know, uh, affirmations and positivity, but it, it's opening up to what's already happening. Yeah, but, um, in what sense would you use that term? That uh, looking for the positive. Yeah, I, I, um, I wouldn't quite use it in that way. I mean, I'd use perspective in a different way, um, in, in a sense that I think to like to give up um, like overindulgence in sensual pleasures. Um, then the most effective thing is to develop meditation until you have access to the kind of um, happiness that comes um, when you leave the sensual world. Um, so if you develop meditation to that sense where you have this in intense um, sense of bliss arising, that's not the goal of meditation. Um, but the value of it is you get a new perspective on the kind of pleasures that you pursue usually in your daily life, it, and you see that there is actually something superior to that and something that you can access within yourself. So, so you have this um, new perspective because you have something outside of that. Um, in, in the case of what I was talking about, um, it, it's more like not sort of taking a positive attitude to the world, um, but just uh, working on the hypothesis that maybe there's a lot of good and beautiful things going on that I haven't really observed. So it's more like, let me open my eyes and test this out. Is this true? You know, it's a questioning attitude. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. 
Hmm. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's not. I'm not uh, completely rejecting the idea of good meditation, bad meditation, but more that our idea of what a good meditation is and what a bad meditation is. Um, no, I, I mean, if you just like um, sit down and just lean back, you know, and just wherever your mind wants to go, you let it go, you know, uh, that's a bad meditation, okay? Um, so for me, uh, like fundamental principle of good meditation is effort. So um, right effort, there's four right efforts that we make. So first right effort is to protect the mind from the unwholesome Dhamma the unwholesome mental quality or the negative mental quality. The second is, in the case that you can't do that and the negative mental quality has arisen, you make the effort to let go of it. Um, thirdly, you make the effort to bring the good positive quality into the mind. And fourth, when a good positive quality like mindfulness, contentment, clarity and so on has arisen, you make the effort to um, to cultivate that. So these four right efforts, this is the bridge between meditating with your eyes closed and meditating in daily life. Because in daily life you do exactly the same thing. Yeah, you're trying to prevent the unwholesome men negative mental state arising, dealing with those that have arisen, cultivating the positive quality. Except in daily life your particular technique and method um, will will change according to where you are and what you're doing. Whereas in formal meditation, you have a very kind of specific parameter for what you're doing and a specific method. So in a meditation, the thing is, you're making the effort. So if you have a lot of um, uh, thinking, um, then you know the work of protecting the mind is you're not developing this interest in the meditation object. Um, as, as well as you could. So you need to develop this enthusiasm, interest in the breath or in your meditation object. Because if you enjoy, if you enjoy meditation object, your mind won't be seeking something else to think about. Yeah, you have to have an anchor to come back. Then it goes off and then you let go and you come back. And it's like any kind of development, learning to play the piano, learning any kind of skill it's, it's just very basic, like it's not mystical, you know, your mind goes off, you put down, you come back, you know, and... Yeah, you have to come back. Yeah, well that's what happens with the breath when it becomes more... Di One of the things you can do is just to um, spread the awareness throughout the body. So, instead, very subtle here, um, it get too subtle, then just feel the breath right through the body, just like you're an oxygen balloon, expand and contract. And just, yes, it so feels really good. And then when you reestablish your attention this way, then focus again on, on this point. Okay. Okay, I think. Is it? Okay. I thought we were going to 3.30. 3.15. Okay, 3.15. Okay. <laughs>
I'm going to leave at 3.30. Oh, you're leaving at 3.30. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much. For you're welcome. Get ourselves off. If we can pay respects to Ajahn Jayasara before we leave. So sit down.